Well, welcome to the uh, to the 1130, which is uh, our new favorite service. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I've been under the weather most of the week, and uh, but I feel like. I do believe that the Lord has a word for us as a church today. Um, he's been bringing us, he's led us to Romans chapter 8. Um, he did that a few weeks ago, and I feel like the Lord stands outside of time. And because he stands out of, outside of time, he always knows what we need when we need it. And uh, we scheduled this series probably five or six months ago, and, um, and you know, we've, in the last couple months, we've just seen exponential influence and growth at our church, and, um, and those who are tuning in online with us, and uh, the beauty of Romans chapter 8 is that it really unifies the church, that's the beauty of Romans chapter 8, it unifies us in what it means to be a follower of Jesus, and, um, and that's what we need. We got so many new faces, uh, so many things going on in our church, so many new people popping in, so many people who have been away from the church for a long time and kind of came back. And Romans chapter 8 is like a beautiful reminder for everybody or a beautiful first step in understanding what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You know, there's a lot of opinions out there. There's a ton of opinions out there. There's opinions all over the place about what a Christian is. You know, a Christian is somebody who goes to church on Sunday, a Christian is somebody who gives money away, a, a Christian is somebody who's a good person, a Christian is somebody who votes a certain way, is aligned politically a certain way. Um, none of that is true. Right? What, we're, what, we're, what we have to do is we have to be solidified on what the author of our faith says is our faith. And so we will open up his word and we'll allow him to tell us what it means to be his beloved or to be in Christ another word, way of saying in Christ is Christian, will allow him to do it. And, um, and so, again, the Lord's timing is perfect because it's, it's bringing together people from all over the place, every tribe, tongue, language, and like we're experiencing such a beautiful thing at our church, and, but we all need to be solidified on the one thing, right? The one thing, the one who is worthy and what it means to be a follower of his. And so, um, so if, if, if you have a Bible, which I know you do today, um, <clears throat> felt like it would have been unfair to yell at you for not having a Bible and then leave you hanging, right? And so we worked <clears throat> to make sure that we have one in everybody's seat this week. Um, listen, if, if you don't own a Bible, uh, we would love to buy you one. Uh, don't steal this one. This one's for, for like next week as well for the people who sit in these chairs. We'd love to buy you one. If you feel like you don't want to buy one and you're like, you need somebody else to buy it for you, we're happy to do that. Uh, in everybody's seat, there's also something called a next steps card. Uh, fill that out. And there's an area on the very bottom that says uh, like other, or it's just a line in there. Or if you're online and you're tuning in online, uh, there's also a next steps card, I believe, that's linked online. Um, we'd love to buy you a Bible. Just fill that out and we'll connect with you on how we'll get it to you. Um, we want everybody to have a copy of the word of God. Um, the word is what the, the Lord uses to bring life to us he, by speaking his word to us and giving us his divine revelation of himself. And so um, every week we study through the word. And so last week uh, we started in Romans chapter 8 verses 1 through 4. If you remember, today we're going to go verses 5 through 11. Um, you could turn there and as you're turning there, I'll give you a little bit of context of kind of where we're at. But um, a lot uh, what, what I said last week is a lot of the world defines Christianity or judges Christianity by whether or not it's helpful, if you remember that. You know, is it helpful to me? Uh, is it, does it affirm me? Does it um, affirm the things that I affirm? Does it support my values? Does it make me better? Does it make my life better? Does it lift up and build up my self-esteem? And the problem uh, with seeing our faith as that and judging it by whether or not it's helpful is the fact that that's not how the Lord tells us to judge it. Uh, the scriptures are rooted in a belief that it is true. 
Like this, whether or not it's helpful or not, in your opinion, is irrelevant to what it stands on, and that is, it is true. And if it is true, then it is likely helpful because living a lie is not helpful. And so um, we're going to study this together to see what is truly Christianity. What does it truly mean to be a follower of Jesus? And Romans 8 depicts that so clearly. So we're going to go verse by verse. We've got three more weeks after this week to, to get through the remainder of the, of the chapter. But uh, I'm going to read to you. Uh, this is starting in verse 1. We're going to go verse 1 all the way through verse 11. And then I'll, um, I'll just kind of break it down for us a little bit. So it says this. <clears throat> Starts out, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That there's zero condemnation. I, I talked about this last week. There is no condemnation from the moment of salvation, the moment a person puts their trust in Jesus. From that point forward, there is not a millisecond that exists from that point forward for all of eternity in which the wrath of God, the judgment of God, you are considered guilty before God. None of that exists from the moment you put your trust in Jesus from this point forward forever. That is so important. And what I said last week, I'll say it again. So many people are living life in condemnation and they see Christianity as a thing where it's like, okay, Christ has given me his righteousness. I'm not condemned, but then I go back out in the world and because I have some flesh, I fail and I fall to my flesh. And so I have to come back to get forgiveness from God because I feel condemned. Okay, I got forgiveness and then I go back out and I'm condemned and people are living in and out of condemnation. And that is not at all what the Lord Jesus Christ desires for his people. There is therefore now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Your life will be better. Your hope will be greater. Your joy will be larger when you come to the realization that therefore there is now zero guilt, zero shame, zero condemnation. Any condemnation that you feel is a feeling and you need to weigh that feeling against what God says is true. And if God says there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, if you are in Christ Jesus, you look at that feeling and you say, in the name of Jesus, you don't exist. You would benefit yourself from talking to your own feelings. I told my wife this week and last week, I think, she's like, what's wrong? What's wrong? I was like, I think I'm dealing with some invalid feelings right now. Her look on her face was like, oh, my gosh, that was, it was probably convicting to her because she feels that way too sometimes, you know? Like, I got some, we have some feelings that don't line up with the word of God. I feel rejected. I feel shunned. I feel stiff-armed. But the word of God says he will never leave us nor forsake us. Why? Because there is therefore now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. And so I take that feeling and I separate that feeling from the truth. And I say, no, you're wrong. This is right. So it starts out, I mean, that, was a, that could be a whole sermon in itself. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life or the spirit of God has set you free. There is freedom in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done, this is the gospel, for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. Like, even if we wanted to, our flesh has been weakened, and we could not do it by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Although Jesus' flesh was not sinful, he was sent in the likeness of sinful flesh. When we see flesh, literally, we, have, we see that in which is sinful. When Jesus had flesh on, he had a different type of flesh. That's crazy. So dope. Can't wait for that flesh. Who wants that flesh? What you're going to see at the end of this, we're going to get that flesh, okay? He says, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So Jesus looked at sin, condemned it, even though it was condemning us. He flips the table in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be filled in us. We have the fulfilled law in us, Christ himself in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live, this is where we're going to spend our time, verses 5 through 11. For those who live according to the flesh. Okay, this is, this is, this is key. 
Those who live, this is, this is not behavior. For those who live according to, or, or those, those who live uh, according to the flesh, set their minds, not behavior. This is a belonging state, okay? This is not behavior. You got, this is the key to understanding this text. This is a state of being to live in the flesh. It's a state of being. It's not an action, all right? Make sense? It's important to know that. For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds, have a mental bet, bent, mental disposition on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, set their minds on or have a mental bent towards the things of the spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh, listen to this, is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is life. That's eternal life. That's the fullness of life. Jesus talks about this in John chapter 10, verse 10, where he says the abundance of life. It's eternal, full life and peace. That's inner wholeness. Well, why? Why would you have full life and peace? Well, because there's no condemnation. Most of us live in condemnation and that condemnation leads us to have no peace. Verse 7, for the mind that is set on the flesh, look at this, is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Oh, man, these next three words. Indeed, it cannot. That's scary. Verse 8, those who are in the flesh, those who are not in Christ or in the spirit, cannot, cannot please or give honor to God. You, however, speaking to the church in Rome that he's writing to, are not in the flesh but in the spirit. If, little stipulation, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. This is Paul's clearest depiction of what it means to be a Christian. Anyone, look at this, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ or the Spirit of God, which are the same thing, does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, here it is, although the body is dead because of sin, huge statement, the flesh never gets redeemed. You hear that? The flesh never gets redeemed. You are more than your body. Paul talks about your body is like a tent. You are not your body. You are more than your body, and your flesh never gets redeemed. Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of God, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life, that's eternal life, to your mortal bodies. This is what we're talking about. Like you're getting a new one, yo. Life to this new body. This, this body that Jesus had, a sinless life, a sinless body, we get that body through the spirit who dwells in you. All right, let me pray and then we'll jump into this together. Father, <clears throat> just ask the Holy Spirit to do this. Would you give us eyes to see what you desire us to see today? Holy Spirit, would you transform us, the scriptures say, from one degree of glory to the next through your word today? Would you grow us in a glorious way today through your word? Give us eyes to see, ears to hear the proclamation of your word. I pray. I know that your word does not return void. That's what your word tells us. Your, it never returns void. It, void. it always does something. But I pray today it would encourage and build up and transform your people. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. All right. Romans chapter 8 <clears throat> um, seems very clear that what Paul's trying to describe here for us, starting in verse 1, and working itself all the way through verse, I believe, I think it's 39 is where it ends, one particular theme, and that is there's no condemnation, okay? It starts out in verse 1, there's no condemnation. In verse 34, it's, he says, who is there to condemn? In verse 35, he's like, what can separate us from the love of God? Like, 
And then he goes on and he just starts dropping knowledge and dropping mics about all these things. Nothing, in, no, no height, no depth, nothing on the earth, under the earth, no demon, nothing in heaven, nothing on earth. No, nothing can separate from you from the love of God for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. And so no condemnation is a, is a massive theme in Romans chapter 8. But there's also something else that we're going to see that Paul is trying to communicate to us in Romans chapter 8. And that is this. There are two kinds of people in the world. And those two kinds of people are not good and bad. You see, the Lord does not, does not segregate us or separate us in terms of good and bad. The world would do that. The world would say, you know, this is good people and bad people. Christians, we don't see the world that way. And we don't see the world that way because although God does see the world in two distinct ways, that there are two kinds of people, those two kinds of people are not defined by good and bad. He tells us what those two different types of people are in Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 5. He says, here it is. Look at it with me. For those who live according to their flesh, those who are living in the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But, that's one camp, but there are those who live according to the Spirit, set their minds on the thing of the Spirit. Okay? These are two different camps. There's one that's in the flesh, and there's one who's in the spirit. God never divides his people the way people divide people. People divide people by sex. People divide people by uh, race. People divide people by ethnicity, nationality, cultural background, social class, education levels. There are two different types of people, but it's not the way that people divide people. There is those who are in the flesh and those who are in the spirit. Now, with all that being said, you have to also understand something that is also clear in the text. There are degrees within each of those categories. I'm like, huh? What? Yes. Yes. Just because somebody is in the flesh doesn't mean that they are as bad or as evil as they could ever be. And just because somebody's in the spirit doesn't mean that they're as good or as righteous as they could ever be. There are degrees to which this works, right? Not everybody in the spirit is as righteous as God desires them to be, and not everybody who's in the flesh is as evil as they absolutely could be. And the reason that this is true is because Christianity isn't about good and bad. It's about flesh and spirit, and, and where there tends to be confusion is people often think about Christianity in terms of what is good or that in which is good versus what is bad or that in which is bad. Or it's good and evil, right? And so those who are in Christ, though, we don't see it this way. We, under, we, we don't see it this way because we understand that we are, it is by grace we are saved through faith alone in Christ alone, period, there are a lot of people out there that are not in Christ that are far more moral than I am. And, and, and some of you are looking at me like, is he allowed to say that? Like, is he even allowed to say that? I don't like, is it? Okay, like, did you hear what he said? Your pastor thinks people that are in the flesh are better, more moral than he is? Yes. Why? Christianity doesn't distinct people. Paul in here doesn't distinct people. Neither did Jesus distinct people by who's more morally good, who's more morally put together. That's self-righteousness or moral deism. This is not Christ's righteousness that is given to us and everything we do flows from that. And it's gonna flow from that differently for every person. It's gonna look different. There's the, like, and the reason why I can, I, I can easily look at people who are in the flesh, but they gossip, they, they're stingy maybe, they're lazy, they're maybe a witch in Salem, or they're a drug lord or a murderer or a terrorist, and they're in the flesh. And look at them, though, with level playing field is because what I understand to be true is that absolutely it is only by God's grace that that flesh wasn't watered the way it was watered for them, and so therefore that didn't sprout in me. Like a person whose heart is moved by the gospel understands that everyone is just as capable as the next person to do good and bad. 
And so we never look at people as like those people. And some of you are so against Christianity, but you're here today. Somebody invited you or whatever, you're here today. But somebody's treated you as like one of those people. And I'm here to confirm for you that the eeriness, the ickiness that you felt when someone treated you that way is good, right, and true. Because Christians shouldn't view other people as those people and us. As if they're the bad people over there and we're the good people. That's not how this works. Why? Because Christianity itself isn't defined by good people and bad people. It's flesh and spirit. And none of us who have the spirit are walking in the fullness of the spirit at all times. And in the same way, listen, those who are walking in the flesh are not walking in the most evil that they could ever walk in at all times. Even if you look at some of the most evil people that have been on the face of this planet, we would look at them and there would be people that were around them in those days when they were existing, or maybe they exist today, that would also say they have some good moments. Because it's about flesh and spirit. Ephesians 2 confirms this, right? You were dead in the trespasses and sins that you once walked in. Dead. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. Doing what? Carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. Says the same thing in Romans chapter 8. And were by nature children of wrath. Like what? Like the rest of mankind, it says. But by God's grace, your nature wasn't nurtured the same way others. Your nature may have been nurtured differently, but your nature was the same. You need to hear that. Christianity isn't about good or bad. It's about dead or alive. Look at verse 5 and 6. Those who live, it says, according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Listen to this. For to set the mind on the flesh, which is to live in the flesh. The mind is only bent towards the flesh. Is death, it says. But to set the mind on the Spirit, right, which is to be alive or made alive by the Spirit, is what? Is life and peace. Now, Sometimes the best way, sometimes the best way to understand the Bible is to not say, okay, what does it say? Sometimes the best question to ask when you're reading scripture is, okay, but what is it not saying? Let me help you see this. Let me help you see what it's not saying. It doesn't say this. To set the mind on the flesh leads to death. It doesn't say that. It says to set the mind on the flesh is death. You're dead. It also doesn't say to set the mind on the spirit leads to life and peace. It doesn't say that. It says to set the mind on the spirit is life and is peace. And the point is that this is an equation. It's not a consequence. Some of you, you've thought of this as terms of consequence. So I have to set my mind on the, on the if I have my mind set on the flesh, the consequence is I'm going to be led towards death. Nope. That's not what it says. Some of us have also been, okay, if I, if I could just do a better job of setting my mind on that in which is the spirit, it will lead me towards life and peace. Nope, that is not what it said. That's not what it says. This is why studying the word is so important. Because most of us have lived in that way. Most of us, we feel down. And we're like, oh, I gotta set my mind, take my mind off the flesh and I gotta set my mind on the spirit. Okay, so I gotta have life. Nope, that's not what this text is saying. He's saying it's an equation, not a consequence. A mind that is set on flesh, has a bent towards flesh, is dead. And a mind who is set on the spirit or is in the spirit is life and peace. Now, the, the word mind here, it means uh, mental disposition. It means a mental bent, okay? And the point is, is that a person who is not in Christ, a person who is not in Christ, not a Christian according to this word, this, what this says, not our opinions, a person who is not in Christ has a bent that is only towards the flesh. 
and that is death. But a person that has any sort of mental bent, mental disposition towards the things of God or the things of, a, of the Spirit, they are alive. And because they're alive, they have life and peace. There's no condemnation, so you have complete peace, all right? And the, the, the point is here, dead or alive, there's no in-between. This is all going to make sense, and this all matters, because at the end of the day, what Paul is trying to do is he's trying to clearly articulate to his people or, or uh, to, to the church in Rome, you're either dead or alive. There's no in-between. There's a lot of talk out there about what it means to be a follower of Jesus or what they used to call Christians as little Christ. There's a lot of opinions out there. You need to understand what it truly is. Those who are alive, they're alive solely because they have the spirit. And those who are dead are only dead because they do not have the spirit. Look at verse 7. It says, for the mind that is set on the flesh, listen to this, is hostile, aggressive, in conflict with, has hatred towards God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. All right, we need to talk about this. You might be in this room right now, and you might be one who is in the flesh. You're not a believer. And you're like, okay, I'm not hostile towards God. I don't hate God. Like, I'm here. I'm like, I'm observing. I'm like here. I'm trying to learn. Cool. All right. He's not saying they're hostile to the existence of a God. What he's saying is, is that they're hostile to the actual God who exists. So you could build in your own mind your own opinions about the God that you think exists, but that might not be the God who this word says truly exists. Let me explain it to you, because look at what he says. He says, for it does not submit to God's law, indeed it can't. So you're cool with there being an idea that there's a God out there, but are you understanding that this God is King and Lord? And what he says is good, right, and true. And therefore, any disagreement you have with him, you're the liar. He is not. See, it's, it sounds good to say like, oh, yeah, it's cool. I believe that there's a God, that God exists. And like, I'm, I'm not hostile to God. No, you're not hostile to your idea of a God. But you are hostile to the God of the Bible. You do not, you cannot honor the God of the Bible. Because the God of the Bible will look at you and tell you the way you're living the way that you're believing and the way that you're operating. Oh, I have come and I will come to destroy that. You will experience my wrath outside of Christ. Like when Jesus comes back, he comes back with fire in his eyes and a sword in his mouth to slay every one of his enemies. And so you can say all day long, I'm not hostile to God. Well, you might not really know who he is then. And, and what the scriptures are teaching here is that for, for somebody who's in the flesh, there's no, it's no tension. There's no struggle to submit to God. It's, it's not even an option in their thoughts. It's not a thought in their mind. They can't even consider it. They can't even consider the idea of, of submitting to God. That, that's, not even, that's not even a part of their world. Why? Because they're dead. Sure, there's tension. Don't hear what I'm not saying, which everyone does. Everyone loves to hear what's not being said, okay? There's a tension between good and bad. There's a tension between good and bad as I define what is good and bad. But none of this has anything to do with submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ. Like a person who's in the flesh, like they, they can't even consider submission to God because they are only in the flesh, and the flesh is only about self-glory. The flesh is only about self-absorption, self-centeredness, self like it's self-centered at its core, meaning the flesh is only that. It, the best a person who is in the flesh can do. The Bible says, again, the Bible says this, you may disagree. I'm going to go with the Bible. It says you cannot submit to God's law. Indeed, you can't. It's not even a tension for you. 
Now, you might want to do different, but that's about you. You might want to live different, but that's more about you. The flesh, the flesh can only be about you. The flesh doesn't get redeemed. So let, let, me, give you, let me give you some thoughts. Like, there's a variety of ways that this plays itself out, okay? So the flesh, it, can only be, it, it only is about me. So, like, therefore, the flesh desires control. Why do I desire control? Because I have anxiety. And the only way for me to feel like I, I, I don't have anxiety, I'm not anxious, is by having control. That has nothing to do with God. The, the flesh can be about uh, pl- seeking pleasure, right? And, like I, I, and so the lusts of the flesh are real. And so, and so I chase after these things. And, and like, I don't want, like, maybe you're, you're like, oh, I don't, I don't want to do that because I know, like, it, like, last time I did that, like, it just doesn't work out for me. And I find myself, that has nothing to do with God. The, the, the flesh, it, 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 could, it could manifest itself through criticism or cynicalism, right? Because it needs validation or it envies. But, but that is not doing that or not wanting to do that might not, sub, not have anything to do with the Lord at all. Am I making sense? Yeah. Right? It could even man itself, manifest itself in, like, in, in giving. I'm going to, the flesh can give away money. The flesh can do nice things. Absolutely. Why? Well, because it gratis, gratifies the flesh. It makes me feel good. I like how others treat me when they see me operating this certain way. So it's not, see, we always, we always put it in terms of good and bad. No, 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 no. There's a lot of good, according to the way the world views good, that you can do in the flesh, but it's still in the flesh. The, the most pushback I get on this typically is around, um, around non-Christian parents, right? So if I have conversations with, like, non-Christian parents, they're like, what are you talking about? Like, like what do you mean I'm self-centered? And I get it, right? Because if you're raising kids, like your whole life exists to make sure they're okay and they're raised up and they're well, yes or no? And so it's really hard, right? The, fr- the, the Because of the flesh, right? It's really hard to look internally and be like, self-centered? I'm a parent, dog. I got children. All about me? I haven't had a free day in eight years. What are you talking about? And, and I get it. I totally get it. As a matter of fact, Jesus understood this. Some, he, he makes this funny statement. So in, in Luke chapter 11, Jesus is actually talking about prayer. And it, one of the things that Jesus does is he can make these statements about one thing that are also true about these other things, you know, but because he's Jesus, he could say it's true about this thing here. And you're like, whoa. Whoa. And then you like see it unfold. I'll give you an example. Like in Matthew chapter 18, when he's talking about, you know, if your brother sins against you, if you come up against me, I, I'm supposed to like come to you directly. If you don't listen, you know, then I got to go bring her in. And I'm like, yo, we got to talk to him, you know. And she's like, yes, we should do this. And so, uh, and then it's like, if he doesn't listen after that, and it's like, we got to bring even more people around. And Jesus then makes this statement. He goes, why? Because when two or three or more are gathered in my name, I am there. Do you know that statement? But many of us will use that same thought when we're talking about prayer. Hey, right? You know what I'm talking about. Hey, let's pray. Hey, all right, well, why? Well, because we're going to pray together because when two or three more are gathered in his name, he's there. No, that's not what that context was, but it's still true. And so Jesus does this in Luke chapter 11. In Luke chapter 11, he's having a conversation with a bunch of people who came, to, who are like trying to understand the Holy Spirit. And he, he then begins to start talking to them, and there's a whole bunch of followers, and He's trying to convince them that you need to ask for the Holy Spirit. Like, you need to, un- you need to submit to, like, understand that, you're, like, it's not your goodness. You need the Holy Spirit. And he gives them this illustration, and he says, he says this. He says, hey, listen, you who are evil, don't you know how to give good gifts to your children? You're like, all the parents are like, did he just call me evil? Jesus is like, yeah, I did. You who are evil, don't you know how to give good gifts to your children? Yeah, I, that's offensive. Yeah, but it's true. When it's true, it's helpful. Okay. And what Jesus is doing, he's saying you need the Holy Spirit because your spirit something's off. 
And then, and then he goes on and he says, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Parents are some of the most self-centered people in the world. And you know it because how you're, when your kids are acting well, you feel great. When your kids are acting wild, you're like, oh, man, this is a reflection of me, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, I got to do better. Wow. That's pretty self-centered of you. Everything's about you. Or if they're acting wild, you don't want to shepherd their little hearts. You want to shut them up so that my life could have more peace. Or when they're being good, you want to take cute little good pictures of them and put it on a gram to let the world know how good you are. I'm a parent, so I'm the worst too, so I'm with you. All right? And, and the point is, is that none of this has anything to do with Christianity. Like, hear this statement. Watch this. Watch this. In hell, in hell, there will be a lot of good, religious, self-righteous, church-going parents who sent their kids to college, debt-free, maybe even Christian colleges, and they drove a lot of miles to soccer because they had no internal power source, no Holy Spirit motivating them towards the things of God. And if that bothers you, that's a revelation for you. Look at verse 9 and 10. Paul says, you, however, speaking to the church in Rome, you, however, those connected to the church in Rome, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And then I, Paul, Paul does this on multiple occasions. And he's like, but before you get ahead of yourself, if, little caveat, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. If you don't have the spirit, you don't belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. This is the clearest statement in all of the Bible of what it means to be a Christian. To be a Christian means that you have the spirit of Christ in you, period. Period, okay? What that means is, is being a Christian is supernatural living. Apart from the Holy Spirit being in you, there is no Christian life. And a lot of Christians struggle with this. A lot of born-again, spirit-indwelt believers, genuine Christians struggle with this. Why? Why? Because of why Paul's Roman, writing Romans 8. Because of condemnation. And so sadly, there's many genuine believers who are constantly questioning whether or not their own salvation is a real thing, right? Although they're alive, they've been made alive, the Spirit of God is in them, they have a bent towards the Spirit, but they find in themselves that they still fall captive to the flesh, and because of that, they feel condemned constantly. But some of us walk around and we never feel condemned when we hear the word. We never feel guilty. There's not even a conviction of the spirit. Well, that says something too. So then how, how can a person walk with a confidence that they have the spirit, that the spirit has made them alive. How? How can they do that? Or how, a, a better way, how can a person, how can you be here today and hear all this and be confident that I'm a, I'm a Christian? I, I have Christ in me. I have the spirit of God in me. How can you know? Like, is it possible? Yeah, the Lord wants you to know. He does. He doesn't want you walking in condemnation. He also doesn't want you walking in doubt. He wants you to question. There's nothing wrong with that. He wants you to wonder. When you see certain things in your soul or you see certain things in your life, you should wonder from time to time, but always walk out of that wondering season with a confidence that you're not condemned because of Christ. Well, okay, so how do I do that? Well, 
I'll give you two things, all right? I won't take much time. I'll give you two things. The first is, do you see the fruit of the Spirit? And the second thing is, how do you respond to the Spirit? Go to Galatians chapter 5 real quick. That's to the right side if you're in one of the Bibles and it's new to you. Nothing wrong with that. We're going to go to Galatians chapter 5. I want us to look at this. We're going to start in verse 16. We're going to start in verse 16. I love the sound of pages. Thank you. <laughs> verse 16, Paul, who's writing this also, is helping people be able to make a distinction between whether or not they're of the spirit or of the flesh. And his point here is, is he's going to give two different categories. A person whose normal practice, normal practice, not good or bad, but normal practice in the flesh looks a certain way, and a person's normal practice who is alive in the spirit looks another way. <clears throat> he says this, verse 16, but I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other. So there's this internal war between the spirit and the flesh. He says, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. What do you really want to do? Think about this. What do you really want to do? You, only you know the answer to that. He continues on. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. This is the normal practice of the flesh. This is the only way that the flesh knows how to operate. Sexual immorality. We well, just stop right there. What do you want to do? Are you mad that there is a God who thinks that he knows better than you and that ticks you off? When it comes to sexual immorality, are you a little pissed that there's a God out there that thinks that he knows better and every time you engage with sexual immorality or a pastor gets up and says, this is sin, God is greatly against this. What you hear is condemnation that then leads you to be like, well, forget God. I don't need God. I'll do it my own way. I'm not going to tell it to you like that, but I'm going to do me. What do you want to do? Or is there a grieving in the spirit, not a, not a I'm sad or I got busted, but a grieving in the spirit because the spirit of God has been grieved and he's in you and you're like, grieve the spirit. I'm grieving the spirit and I want to submit to the spirit, but the flesh is strong. And so I need to confess. I need to work this out with fear and trembling because I'm called to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. Or do you just get ticked off that there's a God that says that he knows better than you and you're hostile towards him because that's all you have. All you know is hostility towards him. That's all you can know because you're dead. You're like, why are you yelling at me, bro? I'm dead. <laughs> We're going to get to that in a second. But you keep going. Impurities, sensualities, idolatries, sorcery. Sorcery. Are there, in, in your mind, like, they're surely cool. Jesus, whatever. Great. I'm cool with that, right? But there's also de other deviations. There's other things, right? There's palm readers. There's, you know, there's the tarot cards. There's the psychics. You know, there's, what's the one? What's the one with like, when are you born? Astrology. Oh, you must be, you know, you're an Aquarius. They're like, no, I'm an Christianist. That's what I am. That's it. That's all I got. No, no, you were born in December. You're a, no, I'm not. I'm a follower of Jesus, period. Rivalries, 
fits of anger, jealousy, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I've warned you before. Again, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. If your natural practice is those things, and look at, there's things like division. Division is like, I'm not fighting for this relationship. Bump that. We're done. You're not fighting for your marriage. You're checked out. You're just okay with division. Yeah, what do I need? I don't need to be reconciled to that person. I'm not saying our boundaries. I'm not saying that. But if your natural disposition is like, oh, you wronged me, you're cut off. Oof, that's of the flesh. He says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there's no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Those who have, those who have Christ Jesus, we're like, we look at those areas, that we look at the flesh that we have, and we're like, no, 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 that got crucified with Jesus. I'm not saying I don't run to it at times. I'm saying when I am in my right mind, I'm saying that has been crucified with Christ. I don't need to run to that. And there's a conviction of the spirit in me, not about good and bad, but it's a spirit. It's about honoring the Lord because the Lord desires my honor because he's worthy of it and he knows what's best. That's what's driving me. See, a person of the flesh never has a desire to honor God. They might want to honor what's good, but they don't want to honor God. They never have that. And so if you find in yourself like moments where you're just frustrated with yourself and you're like, I don't understand why, like, why, why do I, like Paul, keep doing the stupid things I don't want to do? Why am I still falling into this trap of temptation over here? And if, if you don't have moments, if you do have moments where you're just so annoyed with yourself, like what is wrong with me? Let me just help you with that. That is evidence of the Spirit. A person who doesn't have the Spirit never thinks like that. They might think of like, oh, you know, I hope I don't get caught. Or they might think of like, oh, next time I want to do better, right? But it has nothing to do with the Lord. And then, then I'll ask this question. How do you respond to the Spirit? Something very interesting happens in in John chapter, uh, John chapter 6. You don't have to go there. John chapter 6, Jesus makes a statement. He's like, the, the, the flesh is no help at all. The flesh is no help at all. And then, and, and he's talking to his disciples right after he feeds 5,000 people, right? He fed their flesh. And after 5,000 plus people get fed bread with a lunchbox and a fish, right? Because that's what Jesus does. I can't do that. Jesus does. He they come back a day later, and they want their flesh fed some more. And so he, he tells me, he's like, the, the food that I actually have will satisfy you forever. If you eat and drink of this bread, you'll never hunger or thirst again. And he says, and the flesh is of no value at all. It's not helpful at all. And it says that the words that were spoken to them, right, brought them life is what it says. And he says, but then there were others who didn't believe. And so the question I have for you is, when the word goes forth, when the word goes forth, how do you respond to that? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter four that the, the word of God is like a double-edged sword. In Ephesians chapter six, the Bible says that the word of God is the, the, the sword of the spirit is what it says. And so if you're wondering, if you're wondering like, well, how do I know if I'm in Christ? Well, how does the word hit you? When the word of God goes forth, does it just bounce off? So it's considered a sword. The word is considered a sword. I don't mean to be graphic, but hear this. I could stab a dead corpse all day long and that dead corpse is not moving because it's dead. But when the sword or the word of God surgically pierces 
the believer who's alive. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it brings massive amounts of pain. Sometimes it's intricately, surgically kind of making me well. But it never returns void. It always is doing something, right? Right? And so when, that, when Isaiah says, the word of God will go forth and not return void, it will always reveal something to you, meaning if you're dead and the word of God goes forth and you're just excited about the pastor's passion, oh, and that's exciting, I like how excited he was, but it didn't hit you and surgically change something or pierce you and hurt, you're dead. You're in the flesh. But if it hits you and surgically is beginning to change some things, is evidence that you're alive. So I'll ask you the questions. I have people ask me all the time, how do, how do I know? How do I know if I'm saved or a Christian? Well, is there a tenderness to the things of God? Is there a gratitude to God? a delight in God? Do you sense a war in you against the flesh because of God? Do you have moments of agony where you're frustrated at your inability to honor and love and obey God? Like, do you long to be with God. I'm not saying always. I'm saying, have you ever sensed in yourself a desire, a longing to just be with God? Or is prayer always about getting something for you? That's flesh. If the only time, only desire you have to pray is to get something from God, well, that's satisfying or gratifying the flesh. God wants to give himself to you as a friend, as a lover, to be with you, to aliven you. And if you don't experience in that, then yeah, you're probably not a Christian, which is good to know. That's helpful. Why? Because there's, there's a way to become one and to not live the lie anymore. And it's not a prayer It's not a song. It's not a scripture. It's a decision to say, I no longer live. I desire Christ to live in me. And in in Luke chapter 11, I already read it. Jesus says, Jesus says, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit if you ask? And so today, that's all you need to do. You stop playing the game and you ask God to give you the Holy Spirit. This is what it means to be a Christian. If you do not have the Holy Spirit, you are not a son or daughter of God. And if you do have the Holy Spirit, then this should well up a lot of joy that you, he has saved you from your flesh and from sin and gave you new life and a power to overcome the flesh. He didn't leave you isolated as an orphan. He brought you in as a son and daughter and he's made you new. And that's what I want our church to be like. I'm so sick and tired of just having three services and ushering people in and out and just trying to get through the system. You know how much that annoys me? Hate it with all my passion. What I want is I want to be surrounded by sons and daughters of God who have the Holy Spirit 
and people who don't have the Holy Spirit to repent of your sin and come to Christ and ask for the Holy Spirit. Why? Because you're dead and you need life. And I just want you to have life. And if you think that's mean, you don't understand anything that I'm saying. That's fine. I'm sorry about that. That just means that you're dead. You don't understand what I'm saying because what I'm trying to say to you is I love you so much and you're dead and I just want you to come to life. And so ask the Holy Spirit today to come to live inside of you. And how much, how, how much more you as a terrible parent, you're like, I'm not terrible. No, you're terrible in comparison to God's goodness. You are terrible, right? You're, he's holy holy and perfect. You're evil in comparison, right? How much more is your father in heaven willing and desiring and wanting to give you the Holy Spirit right now, the greatest gift of all time, God, the creator of the universe to come and live in you, the author and perfecter of life wants to give you new life. Just invite him in. All, just invite him in. And so here's what I'm going to ask you to everybody in the room right now, whether you're a Christian or if you're not a Christian and want to be one right now, just lift your hands up. Everybody in the room, everybody in the room, everybody, if either, if either you are a Christian or you want to be a believer, and just say, Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to come into me. I need Christ. I need Christ. Christ in me. That's what I need. That's what I need right now. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, that you've humbled me enough to say, I don't need to be good. I don't need to focus on not being bad. I need to focus on Christ in me. Thank you. Give me life. And if your spirit is in me and you're happy to, and delighted to give your children your Holy Spirit right now, give me life. If you're watching in a room somewhere, just ask the Holy Spirit right now, even through your TV, just Holy Spirit, come to me. And his promise is that he will, he will come to you and he will give you life. He will take what was dead and he will make it alive. And now just thank him. Thank you. Thank you for bringing life to this dead being. Whether it was right now in this moment or yesterday or days before or years ago, we thank you for giving us new life in Christ's holy name. Amen. 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 Let's stand. We're going to stand. We're going to stand and we're going to declare how amazing it is that Christ came with flesh that had no sin and his flesh was broken, even though our flesh and soul deserved the penalty of sin. He took it for us. And his perfect body and his perfect holiness was crushed on a cross and his spirit was separated from God so that you can have new life in Jesus. And so today you come to this table and you eat and you drink with God's people as a celebratory thing because of what he's done for you. And one day you're gonna have new flesh after your flesh is broken and after your blood is spilled, you will have a redeemed new body. But until that day, we rely on and we focus our attention on Christ's body that was broken for us and his blood that was shed. So starting in the back, I'll let you come forward in a second. But just know this too. Some of you, if you want prayer right now, maybe you're just like, listen, communion's a little heavy for me right now. I think I might have just received Jesus. I'm going to talk to somebody. I need to be prayed over. I, I, I don't know. I just I need to process some things. We're going to have a, a, a prayer team in that back, right against that back wall. Uh, and they'll have a, a red lanyard on. You go that way if you want to. That's fine. If you want some prayer, somebody will pray over you. But other than that, starting to bet, you guys can make your way forward right now. Take communion or go get some prayer. I love you so much.